Hi, Ms. Carpenter. How are you today? Good. How are you? Good. So the other day you had your visit with your children um, from Children's Services. Uh, what was that like for you? Well, the visit with my children, um, it, it's emotional, um, especially when they talk about my son getting worse. Um, and then they keep talking about coming home, mommy do this for me, mommy do that for me. I uh, get a little overwhelmed. Um, it's been a while, but it'll be about a year since I've had them. Um, I know that I have a lot to take care of for myself, um, and for them to come back right away, I think would be a risk for me. Um, and being able to tell them that I'm not ready yet is really hard for me. They're pretty young yet, so it's going to be hard for them to understand uh, that just because mommy's out doesn't mean she's ready to have them back. Right. Probably going to be pretty emotional when you get out. It is, um, but I think it's for the best. You know, I would rather not rush into something and take my time so that I can be the best mom for them um, and that I can be doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Okay. So, in order to be ready for them, when, you're, when you get out, what are the goals that you have set up for yourself upon release? Uh, what resources are you going to use in the community to help you be prepared for them? Um, well, I looked at the AA and NA schedules. Um, I want to keep myself busy, for one. That's a, a big thing for me, uh, being alone since I've always had my children. Um, and um, so going to meetings, you know, and I live in Mason, so all the um, meetings that are around there, um, there's several. So if there's like a 12 o'clock meeting I couldn't go to, I could go to one at 7.30 at night. Okay. Um, I have aftercare that I'll be doing at least once a week. And you mentioned the Tabert House. Is yes. that where you would like to do your aftercare in Warren County? Yes. Um, I know that when my caseworker for Children's Services asked me about it, mm -hmm. um, that's somewhere I really wanted to go because they see me the way I was and they could tell if I was lying or not doing what I was supposed to be doing. Okay. And, um, you know, manipulation was a big thing when you're an addict. And I know that they would be able to to tell the difference. And I, I'm proud of what I'm doing, and I would want them to be proud that I've turned my life around. It's nice to know that they know who you are. Right. Um, so that follow-up care is going to be important. AANA meetings, uh, aftercare with Talbert House. Uh, what other kind of resources are you interested in or need? when you're released? Um, well, I want to look for some jobs. Um, I know that um, I picked up the Warren County resource book um, about jobs. Mm -hmm. um, really, there's not, there's like a, I think it's called One Stop in Warren County. They help with jobs. Um, I'm going to go there, and, and they let you get online and uh, do your resumes, which I have my resume done now. I saw that you turned that in. Yes. Your resume looks really good. Yeah, and that's just for that type of position. I'm actually doing another resume that has all my work experience okay. on Okay, so this one's specific for customer service. Yes. Rep. Looks really good. It's very detailed. It's got a lot of information, so I think that looks really good. So are there places that you're interested in applying to when you get out? Do you have some ideas of places or jobs that you've had before or ones that are in your area that you like to apply to? Yeah, um, RDI Marketing, it's in Blue Ash. Um, and I worked for them about 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and they really built up as a company. Um, they've moved locations because they've grown so much. Um, their pay is higher than it was to start out, and I'm really familiar with that type of work. Um, and they got good hours. They start you out at full time. Um, their benefits are good there, and it would be easy to have transportation there. I know that I don't have a car yet. That's what I was going to ask about transportation. Yeah, but they have transit in Warren County, and even if transit could take me to Kings Island, um, it's about five minutes from me, and they have buses that go all the way to Kings Island. Okay. So I would be able to be on um, transit to go to a bus station to be able to go to Blue Ash. Okay. So would you need like the transit schedule with that help if yes. you're looking at trying to get around in that area? Right. Something that might help you when you get out? Yeah, and I don't know the bus schedule exactly, so probably a, a metro bus metro schedule. Bus. Okay. Great. Um, what other resources do you think that you might need? Um, well, one, since uh, being an addict, I kind of uh, lost all my belongings. I, I lost my storage. So resources for people that would be able to help with furniture. Okay. 
Um, I have some, but nothing compared to what I had. Like, I, I do need uh, some beds for my children if they're going to be coming home. And those are things, everything's kind of tied in. My children coming back, I have to have things ready. Um, I know I have some time, but um, these places are limited. Okay. Um, and also, um, food. You know, I'm not going to have any income right away the minute I get out. Um, I think that I need to go to um, the welfare office for maybe food stamps. Okay. I know the state of Ohio has a food stamp application that you're able to use. Um, we can even do it online right before you leave so that we can get the process started so that way they can take an effect and you'll have them by the time your children come to live with you. Oh, that would be great. So I've looked over your treatment plan assignments. Um, we talked about um, practice interviewing skills um, so that when you do apply to these places, you know what to say and how to answer the felony question. Um, how do you think you did with those practice interviewing sessions? Well, the only thing I came across was because I'm in lieu of conviction, mm -hmm. was are they going to see the felony or not? Because if they don't, then I don't have to ask the actual felony question itself. Okay. But some applications do say um, your criminal record mm -hmm. or have you ever been arrested. Okay. Um, and in those, um, that's where I would have to come across. Um, what I had said was um, that that was a part of my life where I was an addict and I went through treatment okay. and now I'm trying to better my life. Okay. So. Um, those are questions I'm ready for, especially now that I'm confident coming through this program. If you would have asked me when I first came in, that wouldn't have been a question I would have been able to answer for them. Okay. Um, but having the confidence and you know the determination now to want to work, I didn't really want to work when I first came in, but I think when you want to do something and you have goals, um, you're more determined and you know I really want to work this time, whether it is um, a fast food restaurant, which I've never worked at. Um, even though I had a career, it, it, it did feel in the beginning that I would be belittling myself, getting a job that was lower than my expectations. But now I realize whether I have to work two of those jobs, um, at least I would be taking care of myself and my children. Good. I see that you have a list of sober support that you came up with. Um, is there anybody on that list that you're, you have relationships with now or that you're communicating with now that can help you when you're uh, released? Yeah, and also I, I had just turned that in. I just got a mentor that came um, um, Tuesday. To the Drops Plus? Um, yeah, Good. and um, she was through Holistic Hardware and she actually asked if she could be my mentor. She Great. said she really uh, related to me and felt a connection, and I did too. Good. And when she came, um, she wanted to know my story, and um, I think she lives out there towards Mason too, which is great. So she makes close yeah. to you. And I think there are churches out there too in great. Mason. And um, she asked me to make a list of things that I want her to do or need her to do for the next time she comes. Okay. Um, but on the paper, my dad, um, I showed Miss Davis. Um, he's my stepdad that raised me. He lives in North Carolina. Um, he actually became, he was an addict and an alcoholic and moved to North Carolina and went through the Oxford House for okay. living. And he's been clean for over nine years and he is now a um, service worker for them for the past seven years hmm. worldwide. And I wrote him four times being locked up and he finally wrote me and sent me tons of pamphlets hmm. on the Oxford House. That's nice. And also said that he wanted to be my dad again and that he supported me um, and, and gave me some ideas and things that I should do when, when I am released. I know that the sober support was probably your biggest concern when you're released. Um, yes. Making con the connections of the things that you're learning in the program and implementing those things on the outside is going to be great for you to have that sober support. And I know you mentioned your mom's using. Yes. So what's that going to be like for you when you leave? Well, she will be gone from my home before I'm out, um, but I'm sure she'll be there the day I'm released to see me. Um, I just have, since I've been locked up, I've kind of kept visitations and calls to a minimum. Okay. Um, and when she's come see me or I've talked to her, I've kind of talked about the things that bother me, about her, um, things that I can't be around and the things I can't do. Okay. Um, 
I, I think she understands, but only to a certain point. Um, but I have to remember that I need to do this for me, and she's a grown woman. Um, and even though she won't be around like she used to be, I can still talk to her on the phone. And um, that's just something that, you know, having the other people in place of support, because my mom was just the main one that was always there. Now that I have other people, I won't feel like I'm so alone. Good. I'll have other people to turn to. And your brother is supportive and pro-social as well? Yes. Okay. Looks like you have lots of people in AA that you've come in contact with as sober support. So that's going to be you have quite a few people on this list. That's going to be good. Um, how will you reward yourself when you're out there doing one of the wonderful, marvelous things? What are some things you like to do to reward yourself? Well, when I first released, since I won't have that much money, I thought of uh, things that were not very expensive, um, like fishing. I love to go fishing. And my brother, being part of my support system, he loves to fish. There you go. And we have a lake in our trailer park okay. um, that we get to fish in, so it's very convenient for me. Um, I have fishing supplies, so that's something I love to do. Um, also, we have a park right across the street. Um, just being able to be outside and taking that time for myself to just, you know, relax and, and um, not think about everything. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, I want to I want to get my hair done mm -hmm. and my nails done and, and go tanning. Um, so those things are things that I'll have to take time, set time apart for, and save a little money for those those few things. So not only are they rewards, but it seems like they're also stress reducers, yes. going fishing and going to the park. Yes. Okay. Well, one of the other things I wanted to go over with you today, um, since you turned in your reentry assessments, I wanted to sh kind of go over them with you um, and talk to you about these assessments. So what kind of things in the program have you learned since the, the first assessments that you've done? What kind of things have you learned in T4C or moving on? Um, substance abuse? Well, really, it all boils down to the way I think and feel, really, is the way I react. Um, and the way I react is, is negative, and they have consequences. Um, and really, you know, everyday living, whether it, it's from having a conversation to apologizing, um, there are pro-social ways that I can do that. Okay. I might have thought I, I did them right, but um, maybe when I apologized to people, I was justifying and it made them angry, so I don't think I got anywhere with that. Okay. Um, now I can apologize and just be sorry, and um, with no justification, and I think it means more now when I apologize, now that I'm sober, and I can think clearly about it. Um, also, a big thing for me was like, responding to anger because I wanted to get angry too. Um, now I find myself, even on the day room floor, if, um, I'm responding to anger, I pay attention to the way I feel. Um, and if I start feeling red or shaky or my heart's racing, I know that it's it's not a good time. So it's a risky situation. It is. Okay. And um, then I figure out ways like how to react. And sometimes just not reacting at that time is, a, is the best solution for me okay. because I need to go take time to calm down and to breathe and maybe to give the other person time to calm down. Okay. Um, but kind of taking them a couple minutes in every situation um, that we that I know I didn't give myself time to do instead of that instant gratification, mm -hmm. taking time now, um, even if it is a couple of seconds, um, really makes a big difference. I think it has stopped me from getting shirted and consequences here okay. um, and I've had to bite my tongue and even afterwards I may have, even if I handled the situation, I may still think, oh my god, I never had to bite my tongue so much in my life, but then after my feeling goes away, I know that it was just a feeling and that it passes okay. and I feel better about myself um, no matter what anybody else thinks. So you've used mood surfing as well, yes. just kind of allowing the feeling to exist and not really doing anything about it, but just experiencing it? Right. Okay. Um, preparing for a stressful conversation, and that was something that we talked about before. You also apologized to your oldest daughter. Yes. Um, what was that like for you? Um, 
when we practiced it in T for C, it was almost as if she was right there. Mm -hmm. It was breathtaking for me. Um, and my emotions were getting the best of me. Even though I knew what I needed to do, I was very emotional. Um, but pr after practicing it, when I actually did it, I didn't cry as much as I thought I would. Um, and I realized I didn't have to apologize for everything I wanted to at once. So, so you had quite a few things on the list that right. you wanted to apologize for. I had about for. 42, <laughs> 42 things to apologize for, and I think I got through about six of them. Um, but really, in that kind of situation, practicing before you do it really helped me. I could see your anxiety decrease so much when you were in the individual session with her and the meeting with her. Right. And um, you could definitely tell that that practice was really helpful for you, and it was really important that you did that. Right, and also the list that I made, like, I think the first few things I put on the list were the, one of the most important things I wanted to apologize for. So now that I've got the bigger things out of the way, I have all those small things that it won't even, the next time it wouldn't even be nowhere near as hard. Because I think the more I do it, and, you know, I, I felt like I needed to justify mm -hmm. why I was, but I stopped myself. Instead of justifying, I just apologized for being an addict. Because that was one of my biggest justifications of, you know, basically not being a very good mother. Um, but apologizing for being an addict um, wasn't saying, well, you know, because I was an addict, you know, I did this and this and that. Instead, I just said, you know, I'm sorry I was an addict. Mm -hmm. And I think her being the age that she is 12, that she does understand that that really wasn't me, but at least I didn't have to justify it. And I, I said I was sorry. And I felt like a big weight was lifted off my shoulder. And I think people don't realize, even apologizing, there is a right and, and, and wrong way to do it. <laughs> We've talked about that in group right. before. Right. It's, it's the littlest things that we think we know, but we, we need to relearn all over again. Okay. How do you think she accepted the apology? I mean, what do you think, uh, how do you think that impacted her now? I think she always has known I was sorry, but when I actually told her the things I was sorry for, she probably felt as if, hey, my mom really understands she was wrong for doing this. Mm -hmm. Instead of just covering a big wide area, um, I pinpointed things and I think she, you know, like one of them was, I'm sorry for making her take care of her brother and sister, and that that wasn't right. And I think she may think, wow, I don't need to do that anymore. So she I be think, a kid again. Yeah, she could be a kid again. And I think at that moment she felt as if she was a little girl again. That that you were taking back responsibility of parenting, right. and she didn't have to. And with your other two children having special needs, you know. You will have to rely on her some in the house, but right. not to make that, you know, all her responsibility. Right. Um, I think we've talked about that before, but she's a pretty good kid. Yeah, she's a mother hen to them. She's always, even, you know, they're only first two or 11 months apart and then 18 months apart. And even from the time they were babies, she wanted to be involved. Mm -hmm. And, but I, I took advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I basically had her being the mother. And um, so, somewhat, she'll always be protective of them. She will, and they still say that with my caseworker that mm -hmm. she's very protective of them. Um, and I think that maybe that that's why she has a lot of anger. Mm -hmm. She doesn't really mean it towards them, but she's angry because she kind of had to take care of them, and it took away from her being a kid. Yeah. And she didn't do it because she had to; she did it because she wanted to, because she loved me. And I think apologizing for that just took away a lot and, and even anger towards them so I'm glad that I got to do mm -hmm. that and I couldn't have done that a couple months ago um, I'm just glad that I'm where I'm at now to be able to do a lot of stressful situations mm -hmm. um, and, and be able to have the coping skills to go through them because I was clueless you think you know but you really don't so probably the next step and it seems as though a risky situation would be the conversation with your mom. So I'm sure in T4C, uh, problem solving steps that we're on, um, we could probably work through that right. together and maybe some practice having those conversations with, with your mom. Because those are going to be emotional and they're going to be hard. They are. Um, I don't think the initial conversation will be as bad as what's after, after the fact because I think, you know, she will, even when I've told her in visits, you know, that when she needed to leave and we've had this all set out, 
she still wrote me kind of like, you know, if you want me to leave right now, I will. Like, I could, I could hear the anger and the hurt, mm -hmm. but I can't let that get to me. So being able to still, um, there's so many skills that you can go through. Um, and understanding the feelings of others is a big one because I know that she's my mother and she feels like she needs to take care of me. But I also need to realize she's an addict and I can't be upset at her for the way she is because I was that way. And you were also that daughter that was taking care of her. Right. So that's the other aspect of it is, is yes, she wants to take care of you, but you've also been her parent for a while. Oh, yeah. So reversing those roles back to the way they should is going to be difficult at the beginning because of all the emotions involved. Right. It's going to be difficult. All right, well, let me print off your tracking form from the assessments, and then uh, we'll go over that together. Is there any other concerns that you have right now while I'm doing this? Um. Not exactly. I think we went over a lot of them. I think the next visit that we have before you leave, it'll be important for us to call the Tower House. Right. Uh, get that initial uh, appointment set up so they will uh, attend their aftercare. Um, checking to see what other resources, AA and NA meetings, uh, the Metro bus schedule, are all things that we can look up um, at our next individual session so okay. that you'll have all of that information when you leave. Yeah, and I also, I still need on my discharge checklist, I still don't have my uh, probation officer's telephone number. Yeah, so we'll gather that information. Typically, we let the probation officers know about two weeks before you're released. Okay. So we can contact your probation officer at that time, uh, inform your PO of what your plans are, uh, let them know what you've accomplished in the program and what resources that you plan to follow up with upon release. And then we can ask the PO, you know, if there's any other recommendations that they have that we haven't gone over. So that's something else we can do at our next individual session. All right, I'm printing the, uh, our tracking form. And what it does is it scores all the assessments that you've had. Um, you've had an initial set of assessments when you first came into the program, and then you had the reentry assessments. So this will be an opportunity for you to see all the things that you've internalized or that you've learned in the program. So we have the criminal thinking scale that we gave you back in February, if you can remember that far back. Mm -hmm. And then the assessments that we did with you here. So it looks like we have the entitlements, we have justica justification that's gone down, power orientation's gone down, cold heartedness, and then criminal rationalization, and then personal irresponsibility. So here's the scores that you've had in February, and here's where you're at now, okay? That's a difference. Yep, there's a few changes on there. Uh, we also did the um, Michigan alcohol screening when you first came in your, the drug assessment, and here's your scores there. And then the TCU CEST is something that we also gave you. And as you can see, there's kind of a wide range of scores here. And each one of them, say for instance, desire for help, the higher the score, the better. And in some of them, the lower the score, the better. Okay. Okay. So treatment readiness is high. It looks like you're pretty motivated for treatment. Um, pressures for treatment. There's a 33 out of 50. Self-esteem. Look at that one. Mm -hmm. That one up. Yeah. Because then my self-esteem was really low on the other one. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, depression is low. That's probably lower the better, right? Better the score. Anxiety, and then do you see your decision making? Yes, I can't believe how that one. So did you see the differences between where you were at in February and where you've come since oh, then? Yeah. That's a difference. It makes mm -hmm. me happier. Then you have the hostility and the risk taking as well. So those are pretty low. Wow. So it's kind of neat to see since you've gone through the oh, yeah. treatments, you're getting ready to leave, kind of where you're at. I know that when I was taking the test, you know, when I was filling out some of the questions, you know, like saying, are you depressed now? And I'm like, no, like, and when I first got here, I'm like, oh gosh, I'm so depressed. And I mean, some of the questions, I'm like, there's no way, I'm not, I don't feel this way anymore. I mean, just feel, I felt the difference mm -hmm. taking it. Taking the test itself. Yeah. So the scores kind of validate all the changes that you've been making. and. I even would say if we did your ORAS again, that some of the risks that you've had when you first came in probably aren't there anymore. Um, so I think uh, we have a game plan for our next individual session, um, contacting your probation officer, contacting aftercare, getting that set up. 
I think it'll be important for us to practice talking to your mom. Yes. So whether you want to out on the day room floor, get a couple of your peers and practice, I would suggest you find somebody that might play the, the role of your mom as real as you can get um, so that you can really anticipate emotions and anticipate um, you know, how she's going to react, what she's going to say, right. and things like that. So it would be good for you to pick a couple of the people that you think that would really help you with that. Um, if you need to at our next individual session, I could play the part as mom as well, um, if you feel comfortable doing that. But you have a couple different choices. Okay. Looks like you're almost finished with um, thinking for a change curriculum. You've got two or three more lessons in problem solving. And then um, moving on, you're pretty much finished with moving on. Yeah. What have you learned in that? Really a lot about relationships. Um, especially when we did uh, the one ad. Uh, the one ad was great. The basically the type of man, the relationships you've been in, and I couldn't believe it. I mean, when you put basically, when and you made a list of the different relationships you're in and what they've had in common and, and so forth, um, yeah, my choice of relationships were really bad. Okay. Um, also, when it was, we did this flower chart about um, people we, you know, were close with and we love the we petals. Were, yes, okay. um, and um, people that I didn't think that I would have in there, I did. Um, some people I had in there, I took off. Okay. Um, so, just you know, the type of relationships I want to have, I've worked on since I've been here, mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing that's that's driven me because. You know, mending those relationships, I know that it's not going to happen right away, okay. uh, but me needing to take the first step um, was a big thing for me, whether it came to making a phone call or writing a letter. Mm -hmm. um, I at least feel better or, you know, it comes back to the apologizing, mm -hmm. um, but um, relationships is a big thing. It's a big thing I learned in moving on. Okay. So I don't have very good choices for relationships, but at least I can change it now. And I think that won't add doing that kind of helps put in perspective the choices you were making and yes. the things that you want to change about who you are associating with and who you have in your life, right. especially with your kids' the situation. I think that would be oh, yeah. first and foremost as people I want in relationships need to be supportive of the kids too. Well, we, did a, we did also a pedal just, you know, as extra on friends, the type of friendships okay. we've had and um, the type of friendships we want now. And that was also very different because the friends that I cho chose were not very good friends and the type of stuff they were into and things they did weren't, weren't very good. Okay. And so we also made it, and, you know, one of them was being, you know, not being sober was a big one to have as a friend mm -hmm. and supportive. So um, I definitely changed the way I look at things when it comes to relationships. Good. And then substance abuse class, what are you learning in that class? Um, well, when we do a behavior change, um, that's a big thing. Um, right, right now I'm working on my relapse prevention plan, okay. and um, every high-risk high situation I can think of, um, and the way I thought, you know, the reasons I used, and the way I thought then, it really showed me what I was thinking and why I thought I used. Okay. Um, and I've turned those thoughts around um, on every situation, and I didn't have to use okay. when it came to my actions on the behavior chain. Good. Um, and also having an exit plan is a big thing in substance abuse because you can have all these skills mm -hmm. and everything, but if you're in a situation that you need to get out of, mm -hmm. you need to have an exit plan. We can have the best plans, but we know right. we're going to run into somebody. Right. We know we're going to have an invitation. We might even go hang out with somebody that we think's doing well. Right. And you just never know what kind of situation you're going to be in when you get out. So I think the behavior change is pretty important for that. That helps you through that. Even if you get your relapse prevention plan done um, in substance abuse class, you can continue doing the behavior chains. Um, we do them in aftercare as well. So any time that you're on the day room floor and you think of other situations, you can always use the behavior chain uh, or a thinking report, um, even if you're done with your relapse prevention plan. If you want to, you can take them home with you as well. Oh, I plan on it. We have to do about 15 behavior chains. So, um, and when a bunch of us girls got together that are doing them, you know, everybody's like, oh, I don't know any situations. And I said, look, these are situations we're really going to come across when we are out. We really need to think about this. This is serious because 
you know, we need to know what we need to do. And Ms. Davis told us it was going to be emotional doing it. And, you know, writing them down, and, and I have just started it, but writing down life factors and lifestyle history um, really made me think of, wow, I, I kind of really played the pity mm -hmm. stance, the victim, mm -hmm. and I'm a survivor, and I've been through so much worse. Mm -hmm. And some of those things that were on there, I didn't use drugs for a long time. They happened a long time ago. Mm -hmm. So why did I have to? Why are you using that uh, now, now as a coping tool? Okay. So the past is, is a big thing for me on why I use, and that's another thing. We did the charts um, in different areas, like peer pressures, mm -hmm. negative emotional feelings. Um, and mine scored the highest in negative emotional feelings. Okay. And it makes sense because when I felt sad or depressed, I used. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't about really peer pressures and all that. It was what you were telling yourself? Telling myself. Mm -hmm. So that is something I've, I've really looked at. Um, and what I tell myself when I feel them ways, because even if those feelings are there, I need to still change my thoughts. Okay. Because even if I get sad about something, I mean, I'm going to get sad eventually about something. It's just on what I tell myself. So positive self-talk is going to be pretty important to you yes. in recovery. Yes. Okay. That's one of the biggest things I think I struggled with. And, um, you know, one of the biggest things, though, we did behavior change. And I didn't think I could change my thoughts, as I said, about my kids and their disorders and then possibly having life expectancies. Like, it makes me sad. How do you change the thought of that? And Miss Davis totally turned it around on me. And it was wonderful to even talk to somebody else about that and be able to give you positive feedback. Mm -hmm. And she really impacted how I think about that now. Okay. So even if you think there's something that you can't change your thoughts about, you really can. Even in the most difficult situations yes. or circumstances, positive self-talk is going to be important. Right. Yeah. Good. No other concerns? No, I think I'm pretty good for now. If I do, I'll make a list of them for the next time we meet. Okay. I think you're doing a great job. Um, keep up yeah. the good work. Um, it's been awesome to see you and thinking for change, making the connections, and trusting the process. Um, your growth has been phenomenal. So I keep encouraging you to do what you're doing. Rely on the skills. Rely on the tools that we're teaching you. And I think you're going to be fine when you get out. I know you get a lot on your plate when you get out, and I don't want to minimize that. But I think that you have everything in place that you're going to need to be successful. Part of it's changing those thoughts, positive self-talk, the sober support system that you have. That's probably the most you've ever had in your mm -hmm. life. So that's going to be important. And it sounds like you have a plan in place. So I think you're on the right track. Thank you. It's just still scary. Mm -hmm. There's still a real world out there. There is. And I know that you know when you leave here, you know it seems like you know, all this goes away, but as long as I keep what I learned and just remember to just take that moment, no matter what I'm in, to think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's almost like you, you want a tattoo that says think, you know, just to remind yourself. It's, you know, you got to think, but um, that's like a stop sign everywhere you go. Right. Yeah. So that's a, that's a big thing, but I mean, I'm excited, but um, I'm anxious. I'm not as overwhelmed as I, I was. Mm -hmm a while ago because I've, I've gotten a lot of resources mm -hmm. and I've really, you know, doing the reintegration book, it really helps you to plan for the first week Yes, and then, you know, the first month. The first two weeks, they say, are the hardest. Right. And and putting into a place everything that you've learned and all the emotions that are there. But the most important thing is we teach you in here how to ask for help when you need it. You've got a lot of people that are willing to help you. But More than I thought. When I came in the door, I think I had just my mom who wasn't sober. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, I even have more that's on that list. I think it just really keeps growing. Mm -hmm. And I think it will continue as long as I keep doing the next right thing. You've been talking to your probation officer about the struggles you might have, you know, asking him for help or asking your mentor for help or children's services. You know, sometimes we don't think that those people are able or willing, um, but they're there. That's what they're there for. Keep up the good work. Thank you. All right, I'll see you in uh, about a week. Okay. Okay.